Shalom Aleichem. I'm Ann Toback, the CEO of the Worker Circle. Welcome to the first of our three-part series exploring issues of systemic racism in the United States through the lens of historic moments in Yiddish culture. Thank you so much to all of our co-sponsors. It is so meaningful in these critical times that so many organizations are joining together to explore our past and use our learnings to help us engage in the hard work of overcoming systemic racism today. For those of you who are new to the Worker Circle, we're a social justice organization that builds progressive Jewish identity through Jewish cultural engagement, Yiddish language learning, multi-generational education, and collective activism to change our world for the better. Programs like In the Myth series are a perfect convergence of our European immigrant founders, founders' values and their collective engagement that once helped build the modern day labor movement and more. Today, we continue our activist mission in campaigns for immigrant and worker rights and for voter rights as part of our work partnering in the fight against systemic racism. And now I want to introduce Anthony Mordechai Tzvi Russell, who's going to be guiding us through the next three weeks of learning. Anthony is a vocalist, composer, and arranger specializing in music in the Yiddish language. His work in traditional Ashkenazi Jewish music forms led to a musical exploration of his own ethnic roots through the research, arrangement, and performance of a hundred years of African-American roots music, resulting in the EP Convergence a collaboration with Klezmer band Varetsky Pass, exploring the sounds and themes of a hundred years of African-American and Ashkenazi Jewish music. An essayist in a number of publications, including Jewish Currents and Moment Magazine, Anthony lives in Massachusetts with his husband of five years, Rabbi M Michael Rothbaum. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Anthony. Thank you so much, Anne. Good evening. My name is Anthony Mordechai Svi Russell, and this is Injustice and Interpretation, Leib Malach's Mississippi, the first of a Worker's Circle three-part series entitled In the Midst, an exploration of systemic racism in the U.S. through the magnifying, refracting, and reflecting lens of Yiddish culture. A few years ago, I was on the online archives of Poland's Central Jewish Library, wandering through various Yiddish newspapers of the 1920s and 30s not even for a particularly scholarly pursuit, but rather to find interesting advertising images and funky Art Nouveau, Art Deco, and Expressionist Yiddish typefaces, of which there were many. And it was while looking through an issue of Warsaw's eminent Yiddish literary journal, the Literarische Blätter, that I found a small ad for the run of a play whose title, in a thick, bold typeface, read, of all things and places, with no doubled S's or P's, Mississippi. Tonight, we are joined by our guests, Eli Rosenblatt, PhD in Jewish studies from the University of California, Berkeley, is a scholar of Eastern European Jewry in its global dimensions. He is currently a research associate at Northwestern University, in addition to teaching at the Spurtis Institute for Jewish Studies in Chicago. Previously a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan, Eli's forthcoming article for the Slavic Review, titled A Sphinx on the Dnieper, explores the globally dispersed corpus of African-American and Caribbean poetry in Yiddish translation. We are also joined by Elisa Quint, a Leon Charney visiting fellow at the Center for Israel Studies at Yeshiva University and author of The Rise of the Modern Yiddish Theater from Indiana University Press a finalist for both the National Jewish Book and the Jordan Schnitzer Awards. She is at work on a critical edition of Avram Goldfaden's Shulamis, as well as an edition of the play we are discussing today. Elisa, in an article you wrote last year, you described Mississippi as the most popular Yiddish play about race you've never heard of. So please enlighten us all. What was this play, Mississippi? Hi, Anthony. Um... Uh, it's really, oh, I'm just going to minimize my screen a bit and just say that it's a real honor to be here at the legendary Arbiter Ring. Thank you so much for the invitation. 
Um, and I'm guessing everyone can see my slides, so I'm just going to jump right in and begin with this playbill of, um, of Mississippi that premiered in Warsaw in March of 1935. Mississippi was based on the experience of the Scottsboro Boys, nine African Americans falsely accused of raping two white women in 1931. The boys had been among a larger group of black and white youth who were bumming a freight ride southbound from Chattanooga, looking for work in what were difficult economic times. Midway through the trip, a group of blacks clashed with some whites and chased them off the train. The whites then reported the fight by telephone to the next stop near Paint Rock, Alabama. The police took nine African-Americans off the train and to the Scottsboro jail. Two white women were also taken off the train and fearful of what would happen to them, they accused the black boys and men of raping them at knife point. In little time, the trial judge assembled a jury panel of white men, assigned egregiously inadequate defense counsel to the boys, and they were tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death. So how did a play about this train ride, this trial and appeal, and then a subsequent set of trials and appeals known as the Scottsboro Affair alight on a small stage in Warsaw and eventually play over a hundred times on city stages across Poland under the name Mississippi and not Alabama. So um, I wanna first look at its producers. Mississippi was a brainchild of two men, Michal Weichert and Leib Malach. Weichert was born in 1890 in the Ukrainian city of Stanislav and had a fancy education. He received his doctorate in jurisprudence in Vienna in 1916, and then he studied at Max Reinhardt's celebrated theater school in Berlin. By the 30s, Weichert had himself become a veritable institution of interwar Polish theater. He became the founder and director of a studio that graduated several classes of actors from a rigorous three-year training program, and he had designed it all himself, and it was really the envy of Poland's theater scene and attracted the most celebrated of Poland's directors um, to observe and to participate. He was also the creative director of Jung Theater, Young Theater. Weichert met Leib Malach at the height of Malach's fame in 1933. With little formal education, but for being raised by his grandfather, a rabbinical judge, Malach had begun writing after arriving in Warsaw from his native shtetl at the age of 16 while continuing to work jobs like uh, as a house painter or in a bakery. Uh, he pulled himself up from poor circumstances and eventually supported himself writing for the Yiddish press in Poland, and then after 1922 in Buenos Aires, a city that functioned as his base, as he traveled throughout the Americas, and in the US he came to learn about the Scottsboro Boys. So how did this play come about? Um, in part, the play is a product of a specific and short-lived cultural milieu that presided in a newly independent Poland in, um, after World War I. Poland was a signatory to the Paris Peace Treaty that protected the region's minority cultures, meaning that finally, really for the first time, Yiddish language public performance was protected from government closure and censorship, which had gravely debilitated and stifled Yiddish performance for many decades um, since the theater was founded in 1876. So the 20 year period of independent Poland that begins in 1919 and um, ends with the Nazi conquest in 1939 was the most intensely creative and innovative ever seen by the Yiddish theater. By the 1930s, Poland emerged as the preeminent incubator of engagé avant-garde Yiddish theater as the Polish government had previously closed Weicher down when he staged. So, so there was freedom, but there was also some censorship and Weichert was closed down a number of times for previous performances that he staged. So um, when he sought the permission for this show, he, play, um, he called the play Mississippi instead of Alabama, um, which he thought was um, less provocative or less associated with the Scottsboro Boys. And that was enough to, to um, cover things up um, in the eyes of the censors. Um, they, they didn't pick up on the provocative content. But um, why did these men know so much about the Scottsboro Affair to be so convinced and aligned that this should be the subject of their collaboration? There's two reasons. 
By 1933, the Scottsboro Affair had a transnational profile, which was mostly the product of the communist-affiliated International League of Defense's very bold intervention in the boys' case. From day one, it chose to be more aggressive than the more diplomatic NAACP. The leaders of the ILD published open letters to the trial judge and to the governor of Alabama that called the case uh, legal lynching. And in little time, the League of Defense called on communist parties throughout South America and Europe to publicize the boys' case. So they organized protests and rallies throughout the world, and they inspired um, even non-communist liberal leaders and intellectuals to raise their voice and publicly condemn the injustice. And Albert Einstein is one such figure, and his support is mentioned in the play derisively by an anti-Semitic character. Uh, the Scottsboro trial was covered by the Jewish newspapers and um, always accompanied by moral outrage. And Jews were involved with the case, including the lawyer, who was not left-leaning, but a formidable trial lawyer and whose life would be threatened several times as a result of his dedication to the boys. This story was on the radar of those identifying as Jews, socialists, communists, and Malach and Weichert certainly identify with at least two of those categories. Um, um, so overlap, overlapping that political dimension of influence and the Jewish dimension is a third artistic one. In the United States, a very large number of artists took up the cause. Um, the accomplished printmaker Harry Sternberg wrote tellingly about this era. He writes, most of the artists like myself who lived in New York City, far from the South, were emotionally involved in all the horrible things that were happening to Blacks. Some of us were able to communicate our feelings in prints and paintings, even though we had never seen a lynching or a beating. Closer to the material because of his background and communist affiliation, African-American writer Langston Hughes wrote and published a one-act play the same year the boys were sentenced to the death penalty. Um, it's called, 19, um, called the um, Scottsboro Limited. He writes this in 1930, uh, 1931. It was performed for the first time in May of 1932 in Los Angeles. It was published in a communist newspaper and was also performed in Moscow. So there are real parallels between Scottsboro Limited and Mississippi, but I, I can't say for sure if Malach saw or read this play. Um, both plays are anchored by a scene in a freight car um, where the boys meet each other and trade stories and talk about finding work and also speak more casually about their lives. And I would say that the two playwrights were aligned politically and both hammer home that the epidemic of joblessness in the Depression South created the circumstances of this tragedy. So about the play, Mississippi was staged by a large ensemble cast. 35 people are listed by name on the original poster. Um, on programs and posters, the cast is segregated according to the color of each of the characters' skin. Um, the set designer created multiple stages throughout the space among audience members, and spotlights directed the attention of the audience to the stage it needed to focus on. So it was um, immersive theater um, in, um, they also called it um, synchronous theater. Um, and sometimes the actors spoke their lines, sometimes just, sometimes just one or two lines of dialogue before the spotlight went dark and another, another spotlight trained on another stage would go on. And um, they obviously um, collaborated very closely because Mala's script really reflects the knowledge of this type of staging and indicates each scene with letters. Um, and in one such series of scenes, for instance, Scene A features the white girls, with the, with the boys' accusers, in their apartment dancing to music on the radio. Simultaneously, in scene B, on a different stage, the sheriff visits the home of Katie, the mother of the youngest boy accused. Um, first in the dark, and then with the spotlight, we hear the sheriff deliver the news of her son's arrest. And yet a third scene, um, in, um, it takes place in the chapel of a prison. A priest oversees mass for the boys, first in the dark and then with light and volume. And the simultaneous scenes highlight the indifference of the ladies, the heartbreak of the mother, and the hopelessness of the boy's situation. These islands of stage theater in the audience, so the theory went, made the greatest demands on the power of the audience's empathy. 
So I just wanna say something about how the play grapples with racism. While it raises the banner of class conflict, the play also shows racism in different forms and from different angles. In one scene, for instance, members of the racist Lily White movement lavish gifts and sympathy on the boys' female accusers. And in another scene, uh, one of the boys in prison recalls the ugly racist chant of the Ku Klux Klan as he was forced to watch them set a man on fire. In bits of dialogue, the play clarifies the boys' irreversibly tragic situation. Um, if we are free, says one of the Scottsboro boys to the other and to their lawyer, we will be lynched or we will always fear being lynched. Now that they've been accused, they realize that they are safer in jail. Um, another scene sheds light on the social reverberations of this tragedy. A woman calls over an African-American boy to shine her shoes on the streets of New York City. And he, ca he can't, he replies, he doesn't wanna be accused of rape. And I think here Malk is trying to reflect how the trauma of just hearing about these events from afar conditions the thinking of this young boy and many young, young boys. The play goes far in trying to humanize its subject and infusing the play with what it, its producers imagined as authentic African-American culture. One character, for instance, is a former decorated soldier in the American army, while another's life was shaped by the great migration of African-Americans and now lives in Harlem. And the script is also embedded with an array of original Yiddish songs by the celebrated composer Henoch Kahn, who composed songs in the African-American musical tradition, including, including jazz, gospel, and Negro spirituals. One makes reference to the enslavement of African people, Another refers to the part former slaves took in the Union Army fighting in the Civil War. And actors wore black makeup with the objective to become their subjects and even perhaps to educate its mostly Jewish and Polish audience as to what African Americans look like. Um, in this, the play hardly meets the standards of political correctness. Um, but according to the standards of its own day, I would speculate, it was, it was very progressive. It strove for a sympathy with and curiosity about the texture and history of African-American life. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it there. I know I raced through a lot of information, but I'm very um, keen on hearing what Eli has to say. No, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Elisa. I would like to temporarily assume the role of communal scapegoat for a moment and say that when I first encountered the existence of Mississippi, I was completely surprised by the fact that anyone in Poland in the 1930s had anything to say about the kind of events that the play portrays or knowledge of the Scottsboro Boys trial itself, perhaps least of all avant-garde Polish Yiddish culture types. Now I would say I was coming from a place of complete ignorance. So Eli, please walk us through the various cultural processes by which black people and their experiences became subjects of Yiddish cultural interest. Eli, are you there? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. I apologize. It's okay. Um, <laughs> can be heard now. Uh, so I just want to thank um, Anthony and the Worker Circle for inviting me to participate tonight. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to contribute something to the to the current incarnation of the Arbiter Ring, and uh, I'm really, really glad to to be here. Um, at this point, I'm going to say that I'm going to forego the the approach of a of a lecture uh, and sort of bring us through some of the uh, visual richness uh, that can give a kind of uh, historical context uh, and a historical texture uh, to a play like Mississippi. Um, and as uh, Elisa noted in her presentation, um, there were um, contemporaneous engagements with issues of race in interwar Poland. For example, there was an image there of Eugene O'Neill's all God's Chillin' Got Wings, which was, although he was a playwright of European American background, uh, it also took on African American subjects. I'm gonna share my screen now and uh, bring us to some visual slides here. Okay, uh, can everybody see that? Yes. You can see that, okay. <clears throat> 
I'm going to play. Okay, so um, basically what we're going to look at tonight uh, are images of Americans, African Americans, uh, and American racism in Yiddish. Uh, and we're not going to have an exhaustive, comprehensive look at these issues, but what I've selected are a few sort of emblematic examples of how American culture, uh, Black American culture, and American racism were uh, represented in, in Yiddish, basically from the middle of the 19th century uh, and the advent of the Haskalah and the Yiddish Jewish Enlightenment in Eastern Europe uh, up until around the time of the play. Um, so there's a couple things that I just want to say from the outset that are sort of um, some of my theses here. Um, I'm just going to move this out of the way. Um, so the first claim that I'm going to be making with some of these images is that images of American racism were not a product solely of American Jewish immigrant experience, uh, but emerged first in the European Jewish imagination. And that's why a play like Mississippi being in Warsaw and throughout Poland is very important. Um, and Yiddish images of African Americans of America and of blackness uh, are deriving from the Jewish enlightenment and Jewish enlightenment figures exposure to European scientific and colonial discourse. So American travel reportage, geography, natural history, all of these scientific disciplines came to bear in some way uh, on how race functioned in the American or the Atlantic world. Another way that images of race and racism emerged in Yiddish culture is through the translation of European and American racial language. The simple question of how one refers to a black person shows the sort of uh, complexities of representing racial difference in the Yiddish language. And over time, uh, images of racism, of American racism, and of Black people shaped how the politics of being Jewish was described and mobilized by the Jews themselves, as well as their advocates, their antagonists, and just simply their neighbors inside and beyond the Jewish community. This again is, pertains very well to Mississippi, which clearly in speaking about American racism was suggesting something about their own Jewish experience. So now we'll start with some visual images. Uh, the first major Yiddish periodical uh, to emerge in the Jewish Enlightenment era in Odessa, Kolma Vassar, its first issue on its cover page was an article about the American Civil War, which had only begun uh, a year before, I, I guess, uh, this was published. And in a long and poetic uh, discourse on the roots of this violent war, uh, they say very interesting things, some that I've posted here. Uh, the writer will say, many have written about the slaves, but they write according to their own interests. Others have written that the planters work the slaves like horses. Uh, when they describe the American Civil War, uh, the, the writer, the author of this article, which may have been Alexander Zederbaum, the editor, uh, claims that this is a war between brothers. Uh, so there was a sense that American culture uh, was a cohesive society born of industry and yet racked by this internal contradiction. Uh, and not only an internal contradiction, but uh, an issue of moral and political complexity that had the potential to sever uh, the coherence and the cohesiveness of that society. Um, I have another image here coming from the 19th century, um, also in Eastern Europe, but this time not in the Ukraine, but in Warsaw and Poland, uh, and a small ad that appeared uh, in, in, the in the newspaper, the Epoch at Sfira. Um, and it says, paraphrased, a magnetic, fantastic, and electric performance Dwarves, little miniature maidens, opening performance by the African Negro, Tomas Charlie. So this image is uh, in pure 19th century fashion, uh, a kind of ad for a kind of uh, freak show, you could say, a show that we know from American culture in the 19th century uh, also had a European life. Uh, and what you can see from this image too, 
uh, is the uh, circulation of West European forms of entertainment among the Jews and the non-Jews of Warsaw. Um, the 19th century really announces to us uh, that Jews are becoming more familiar with the concept of race, not only through the, through the discourse of race science and racist anti-Semitism, but also through uh, West European colonial discourse. Uh, we don't know much about Thomas Charlie, uh, but he is described in other newspapers as world famous. Um, and it says here that they work from 10 in the morning until 10 at night. Um, the Yiddish racial imagination also um, has a literary uh, and a journalistic um, aspects to it as well. Um, and here we have three images from the mid to late 19th century up until the early 20th century. Uh, on the left is the cover page of the Yiddish uh, adaptation of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, in that book, the Yiddish adapter, the Yiddish translator, Isaac Mayer Dick, uh, turns Tom's slave owners, Arthur Shelby and Stowe's original, to Jewish slave owners. Uh, and this is in many ways a comment on using American racism uh, and American class conflict uh, to say something about serfdom in Russia. So it's a way of using America as a lens on your own society as well. Uh, the early 20th century Yiddish forverts uh, pretty commonly used the N-word, uh, not Negro, not Neger, but the, the N-word, uh, in some of their sensationalist crime reporting. Um, and so this is to show uh, that the Yiddish press, Jewish discourse uh, in early 20th century America was not immune uh, from racist attitudes circulating in the broader society. And I think that contrasting this kind of discourse uh, with a play like Mississippi shows the way that sort of two truths uh, coexist. On the right is a, a very interesting text, a performance piece called The Negress, uh, which, is, which was translated into Yiddish in the late 19th century, reprinted in the United States, and is based on a German story a 19th century German story about the Haitian Revolution. So again, uh, images of race, images of blackness drawn not from firsthand experience, but through literary translation, and really in a sense, the reception of German culture. Um, I also wanna say something as we sort of progress towards the time uh, that Mississippi is staged, uh, that the African-American press uh, notes and recognizes uh, the circulation of Jew and Black in dialogue with one another. And you can read this uh, for yourself, but it's a fascinating comment from the front page of the Chicago Defender. And it says, we know that anti-Semitics will tell us that most of the Jews are Bolsheviki. Well, if this civilization is so constituted that oceans of Jewish blood are to be shed and half a million Jews are to be exterminated, then I would to God that all Jews may become Bolsheviki anarchists or anything, anything but participants in a system which preaches love on Sunday and wholesale murder and so forth. Um, these kinds of themes are not only present in, Af in uh, Jewish discourse, but also um, in African-American discourse. Uh, as we move on uh, into the interwar period and closer to the staging of Mississippi, uh, we start to see a real Yiddish intellectual uh, and literary engagement with African-American culture. So not only the representation of black subjectivity, um, but also the translation of black subjectivity or black poetry from its original English uh, into the Yiddish language. And here we have a short story by Rudolf Fischer, uh, which is translated as Ira Miklot, City of Refuge, a classic short story uh, of the Harlem Renaissance and uh, published in Der Hammer, a communist um, monthly journal of the Morgan Freiheit. Uh, as we move on, I wanted to also include uh, the literary layer of Yiddish engagement with Scottsboro. Uh, here's the translation into Yiddish uh, 
uh, of County Collins poem, Scottsboro II is worth a song. Uh, this translation it was published in Moscow in 1936 um, and represents for us the fact that the Yiddish encounter with American racism uh, and with blackness writ large uh, was an internationalist uh, phenomenon. And it had different political ramifications, different political implications as uh, its uh, venues changed across the globe. Um, there were also other types of engagements with uh, African-American culture at this time, all of it in many ways uh, connected to the Yiddish avant-garde. In Bucharest, Zisha Bagish's translation of Langston Hughes, uh, criticism, uh, literary criticism of Langston Hughes and Literarische Blätter, um, and other more idiosyncratic engagements with African-American culture, this by a Yiddish poet, Pine Tversky, uh, who published in New York, but lived all over the world uh, and was known for uh, his translations also of County Cullen. Um, as we sort of conclude the, the imagery that I've shown, and I've gone through quite a lot and we can refer back to it. Um, there was even more engagement in Moscow, you could say, with African-American literature uh, than there was for a time in New York. Uh, and I think we'll discuss a little bit about the relationship between uh, left-wing politics in Yiddish um, and African-American um, uh, politics as well. Um, so I will stop there and I will uh, return to uh, Anthony. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so I'd like to ask you both, um, what was the cultural and political climate that created not only this play, but also an audience for it? Um, well, I can begin um, just to talk about the audience of Mississippi. Um, one of my favorite research questions is to ask, um, who, who, was attending, um, who was attending the Yiddish theater? Um, and there is little surviving evidence. Um, we don't know exactly, but I collect bits and pieces from memoirs and newspaper reviews. And I also extrapolate from the venue and the neighborhood um, of the venue. So who came to the show? In, in this particular show, I think there were four elements that I can, um, I can pin down. Um, by ideological leaning, Weichert sought to reach the working class. And so he, rec he recruited actors from the working class. And at least in Warsaw, he used um, a Jewish tailor's guild hall um, where he, he put on Mississippi. And this would have encouraged a working class audience too. Um, the second element is a Yiddish speaking Jewish intelligentsia. Um, and that's deduced from the newspaper coverage. The play was reviewed in the Yiddish dailies and literary journals. Um, by left of center voices. The third, we know Polish speaking Jews attended because it was reviewed in the Polish press. And then non-Jews. There were non-Jews in those seats. Um, we know from anecdotal mention um, in memoirs, including Weichert's own memoirs, but especially with Weichert's show and this show in particular, um, because it was one of his later shows, um, he was a known entity, known quantity. And if you were interested in experimental theater in Poland, you had to see, or in Warsaw, you had to see Weichert's show. And so they were well represented too. Um, and so that's all, I don't know, um, you know, how representative those elements are, um, but um, I would say mostly Jewish audience and some um, Polish intelligentsia and theater lovers. Did a translated Polish libretto exist for the show so that um, Polish speaking Poles would be able to follow along with the dialogue and what was happening? Or was it merely um, an artistic experience that they were, they were witnessing? Yeah, I don't know how they, how they did that. Um, you know, there are, um, we know that there were collaborations between um, Polish directors. We know, let's say, the Polish director Leon Schiller directed a show um, in Yiddish once, and I assume he doesn't know Yiddish. 
Um, so somehow they were able to transcend um, the language barrier, but no, there was no, there was no script that they could have relied on. They, they might have, they probably all knew the story from the press and extrapolated. Okay. I think also, Anthony, it, it's interesting to think, you know, the, this audience uh, as being kind of plugged into the um, internationalist flavor of the avant-garde at this time, in the sense that I think going to a play like this could have made a viewer feel closer to their family living in America. Meaning a play like this is a kind of cultural event that speaks to, at this time, the circulation of Polish Jews or Eastern European Jews with the United States in the sense that in the decades previous to this play being staged, there really was a kind of cultural dialogue between American and Eastern European Jewry. Um, and, and I think that's, a, that's also a key element of this, uh, is that this play obviously was popular because American culture at this time uh, is popular. Yes. It's hip. And it's, uh, it, there was a craving for it, not only among the, the Jewish working class or the Jewish middle classes, but I think amongst a lot of different middle classes, a lot of different ethnic and national groups in Eastern European space at this time. Uh, and a play like this, I could see, uh, and I think we'll talk about the music later, uh, really being another way to experience jazz, to experience black music, black culture, uh, and in, in pure, not out of sympathy with politics, but out of an interest uh, in uh, foreignness, an interest in foreign culture, um, and in, in black culture specifically. I remember, uh towards the end of the novel, uh, Die Familia Muschkat, um, which basically ends in the beginning of the Holocaust, I was actually really surprised by how often the characters were traveling between the United States and Poland. Um, there were just parts of the family that were constantly going back and forth. And the tragedy of the novel is that there are people who ended up in Poland basically at the wrong time and were unable to go back to the United States. So mm. I think, yeah, what you're kind of describing is this relationship um, between these two countries. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So I'd like to turn our attention briefly to the social impact of the trials themselves. What was the greater meaning of a trial like the Scottsboro Boys trial to people at that given time? Um, so um, I would, I mean, I think Eli um, really um, unfurled a lot of it um, already, but I would say um, I, I, I would say that for the, the larger meaning for the audience um, and especially the people who were involved in it, um, um, I think the Scottsboro Boys um, showed. And not just and not just for Weichert and for um, Leib Malach, but also for someone like Langston Hughes and others, that the ideals of justice and equality in America um, could not be relied upon to extend to be extended to um, its African American citizens, and that a political system that claimed and seemed to deliver on its promise of equality was communism. In other words, I really think that they believed in um, the communist underpinnings of um, of this play, um, and um, which, which I guess is a sad thing to acknowledge now um, in, in certain ways, but I think that was its, its most, let's say, most important political uh, message for those involved. It's interesting because the 20s and the 30s seems to me to be uh, these decades of these sensational trials, I'm thinking specifically of the uh, Sacco and Vincetti trials. Um, of the, um, the trial and eventual execution of two Italian anarchists and how much of a, an international splash that trial made in various uh, leftist circles across you know, the entire world. Um, and one really gets a feeling that these, these trials meant 
so much more to these large various constituencies than they would seem to in, in their in their own context. So, um, and this play is kind of proof of that, you know, uh, to, cert to a certain degree, um, that it was considered to be worthy of, of dramatic depiction in Poland of all places. Yeah, it's also, a, there's a transition, I think in the 30s or the late 20s, uh, the Soviet Union begins to emphasize uh, in, more, in more specific terms, uh, a kind of internationalist multinational empire in which ethnicities, nations, uh, they call them nations, coexist under the communist system. And the way in to that internationalism for the United States was through African Americans. But what emerges, I think, at that time is a Soviet internationalism uh, that has kind of, that's inventing a tradition or inventing a s signposts along the way that give cohesion to the movement. So you have uh, African American causes commingling uh, with causes on the left in the Spanish Civil War, uh, Italian anarchists, all kinds of different uh, conflicts between the capitalist classes and the proletariat are all uh, are all examined as the, as one uh, in a way. And I think that uh, for you know an audience in in Warsaw. Um, the African American piece was a way of uh, simply enriching a, a leftist ideology, uh, showing the internationalist scope of that ideology uh, and transcending one's Jewish particularity uh, through the experiences of another. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So mm -hmm. their experience of black people, even on stage was as fellow proletarians, yes? Yeah, I think that that was how they were presented in this play in particular. Mississippi was a bona fide popular theatrical phenomenon of its time. I'm curious if you think that was because of the novelty of seeing a miscarriage of American justice depicted on stage, or whether there were some elements of the trial that hit home to a Warsaw audience of the 1930s. Yeah. So. I think, um, again, building on what Eli said, I, I think the transnational fervor for the Scottsboro trial, and it was um, it was unprecedented. I mean, there was the, the big precedent was the Sacco and Vanzetti trial, which was also um, embraced by communist organizations across Europe. Um, but and, and then this one, the scale is even larger um, for the Scottsboro trial. But I think the engagement was fueled by communist groups um, and in part um, as anti-American propaganda. Um, but again, like when you look at this play, I, I see so much real personal identification on the part of Weichert and Malach with the, with the characters. Um, but also this um, attempt to really um, to respect or acknowledge the particularity of their culture. So, um, um, so um, a, a lot of the reviewers um, point this out and, and talk about the plight of African-Americans in America. And then later in, for let's say um, uh, performances in 1937, a couple of years later, I begin to see reviewers saying um, things like, well, aren't we the Blacks of Europe? Um, isn't this about um, us as much as it is about them? And so, um, and, and, and sentiments of that kind. It's interesting because I was just saying before that I think of the 20s and the 30s of being decades of sensational trials, and I completely forgot about the Dreyfus Affair, which was one of the most internationally covered trials um, specifically centered on a, on a Jewish individual. So maybe there was some sort of residual connection as far as a trial actually being a place where um, the prejudices of a given society were sort of um, sifted through, um, given that that was such an internationally famous case itself. Right, well, Dreyfus is um, 1890s if you wanted something less far afield, um, uh, and this is almost forgotten by history, is the trial of Sholem Schwarzbart in France, who was put on trial for killing um, 
the Ukrainian Petlura, the Ukrainian leader Petlura, um, uh, he just assassinated him in the streets of Paris um, in, in revenge for the Ukrainian pogroms. Um, and, and there too, and he was, and he was let off. Um, 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 this, the defense that he was, um, he assassinated Petlura because of the trauma and, and revenge for the pogroms um, convinced the jury. And um, it, it's, it's interesting to think about it um, alongside Mississippi and the Scottsboro boys. I, I never did that before. It's, it's interesting to think about it as a trial. Um, I think um, when you, Elisa, you, you referenced earlier that the play Mississippi uh, demonstrates an interest in African-American culture, in African-American music, in African-American experience. Um, and there's a, you know, the question of how we understand that. Um, why or how are, are Black people being represented? Uh, the politics aside. Um, and one thing I can say to that uh, is at this time, in, also in the Soviet Union, but all throughout Europe, uh, folklore and the study of folklore is a really a political battleground. Uh, and to simplify it for, uh, for, for this audience, the folklore is seen to have uh, one or two uses. Uh, one is uh, studying folk folklore to uncover the national spirit, the mm -hmm. folk dice of the nation. Uh, and this practice of folklore study was very popular in Germany and folklore studies came to inform Nazi ideology, um, looking at folklore of the German people as the repository um, of its new era in fascism. In the Soviet Union, folklore had a different purpose, the study of folklore. And Soviet Yiddish folklorists went back to the Jewish people in order to find elements of traditional Jewish culture that comported with anti-capitalist sentiment. Mm. Now, a lot of uh, what you'll see in Yiddish uh, depictions of African-American culture of this period mm -hmm. uh, are whether these writers are inclined more towards the German nationalist model or more inclined towards the Soviet internationalist model right. of folklore. And so in a play like Mississippi, I would gather, although I have not, I, I'm not an expert in this particular play, I would gather that Leib Malach and Weikert took a more uh, Soviet oriented uh, approach to African-American culture. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't, it's actually telling uh, that these two attitudes towards race, one that was nationalist and interested in the- um, The essential the essential black right. man. Right. Uh, and then at the same time, looking at black culture as something that simply indicates uh, class struggle on an internationalist, non-nationalist basis. And I think that tension exists in a play like this, probably, certainly with the black face, with the black makeup. Uh, this is obviously a practice of West European and American culture, not Soviet culture, black face. But at the same time, it coexists with uh, internationalist sentiments, anti-racist attitudes, um, and so forth. It's interesting to me that there are oddly overlapping timelines in relationship to the Scottsboro Boys trial and the play itself. The play logistically depends on a simplification of a trial that was going on at the time that the play premiered and continued on through the decade by virtue of retrials, convictions, appeals, reversals, and final decisions. By the end of the 30s, the defendants had been imprisoned. The playwright, Leib Malach, had died in Paris a little more than a year after Mississippi premiered in Warsaw. Um, Elisa, what was the afterlife of the play after its premiere in 1935? So the play was translated into French. I haven't found that translation. Um, it wasn't published. Um, uh, 
and I'm not sure if it was performed. I'm still piecing the stage history together. Um, it was translated and published in, um, in Esperanto and um, in 1939 in Paris. Um, it was performed in Buenos Aires in Yiddish and in New York City in Yiddish. Um, and I still haven't found too much about those performances, but um, I'm piecing those together. And lastly, it was, it was translated into Hebrew and put on in Palestine, I think soon after this production. Um, so um, I think um, that accounts for, I, I think all of these happened before the war, all the performances. You know, I've, I've read about it being an international phenomenon, but I didn't know it was that international. I just thought maybe it had been Poland and Buenos Aires. I didn't know it actually had come to New York. Do you have any idea like where in New York it might've been performed? Not yet. Ask me again very soon. All right. <laughs> So let's get into the peculiarities and the particularities of a play like Mississippi. As we saw earlier in the images of the cast from the play, the actors performed black characters in what could arguably be called blackface, at least in appearance, if not in the content of their performance. Do you think that this in any way undermined the political impact of the message of the play? I'm going to, I'm going to keep it brief because I know I think Eli has some really interesting things to say about this, but I, I would just say um, that um, I think for them, and, and probably they were right, that it, it did strengthen the political impact of the play. Um, mm. And um, it underscored the brotherhood that transcended difference. I think that's how they saw it. Um, and um, that's what they wanted to um, visualize and have the audience visualize um, on, the, on the stage. So there was a quality of solidarity in actually sort of assuming the, the appearance of the characters that they were playing is, is what you're saying. That's what I think, yes. Hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, I said, to, I said to you, Anthony, in the previous conversation, um, I think it undermines the political impact of the play today Yes. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, um, I do think that there were probably, uh, you know, um, using blackface or black makeup uh, was a poetic device that layered uh, Jewish experience onto African American experience. At the same time, um, there's no doubt that the viewers of this play were not. Uh, completely foreign to European depictions of minstrelsy um, and of racist depictions of African Americans uh, more broadly in, in the broader European discourse. Um, so I'm not sure that it undermined the, the political impact of the play for an audience that at that time probably couldn't really differentiate uh, the way that we can. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's, I think, like I said before, that sort of two truths can coexist here. Yeah. Uh, the play was part of a longer historical story uh, in which Eastern European Jews received and refracted uh, European racist discourse broadly defined. Uh, and at the same time, identified uh, with black suffering and were cognizant that the hatred and antagonism towards their own community uh, was increasingly uh, placed in uh, racist terms. Uh, that is that Jews were biologically doomed, uh, maybe for different reasons than African-Americans were biologically doomed, but shared uh, something in their mutual inferiority uh, to what was considered at that time uh, white supremacy, uh, Aryan supremacy. There's no doubt that there are structural resonances between Jewish and African-American experience at work in a play like this. Uh, and I think that those structural resonances uh, contrast somewhat very productively uh, with how this play is embedded in uh, the Europeanization of Jewish culture yes. uh, in Europe. Uh, it's those two things coexisting uh, 
that make this place so uh, fascinating and I think relevant to contemporary Jewish American experience or Jewish experience more broadly. It's interesting. Um, I really can't call this a precedence because it happens after the fact, but um, I've encountered um, word of a production of Kurt Weil's Lost in the Stars being performed by the Habima Theater Company in Tel Aviv in the uh, early 1950s. And that show, the majority of the cast are, are Black South Africans. So there seems to be a parallel as far as an entire oh. ca cast of, of Jews um, basically depicting um, Black people on stage. Um, and it's also interesting to consider the fact that that um, there already had been uh, a previous production of um, Mississippi in Palestine. I have to wonder if some people who saw the one actually saw the other. I mean, even outside of Yiddish culture, I mean, the famous Sophie Tucker, uh, I think born in Eastern Europe and an American Tin Pan Alley star, her earliest performances were in blackface, and then she very publicly disavowed I didn't know that. blackface. Uh, I didn't know that either. Yeah, there's a, a instances. I mean, of course, the jazz singer being a famous example of Jewish blackface. Right, but uh, I always think of that as being more of an American phenomenon, an American popular culture phenomenon, as opposed to kind of uh, entering through the ranks of sort of high culture, avant-garde culture, that kind of thing. Yeah, so. I agree, would agree with you. I think it's had that the jazz singers had a, an impact on how scholars have understood um, mm. Jew, Jews' relationship to race. Um, that, that's for sure. As a historic work of historical significance, I, I couldn't say, but. So the play being in Yiddish necessitated black characters speaking in Yiddish from the stage. How strange might this have been to the audience? Was there any precedence for um, black characters speaking in Yiddish from either a stage or in literature? So, Eli? That, I mean, certainly the translation of African-American literature into Yiddish is a kind of uh, Yiddish voicing of African-American speech, uh, but the complexity of translational practice would preclude any kind of, uh, I think, equivalency with, with blackface performance, Jew Yiddish performance in black makeup. It's a little different than that. Right. Um, I think that there are quite a, there's quite a corpus of Yiddish poetry uh, that uses a Yiddish speaker in trying to inhabit Black subjectivity or address Black subjectivity. Yehoyish has a famous poem. I think it's called uh, To the Negro or something like that, um, and in which in 1919, he addresses uh, African-American suffering, representing Black people, anti-lynching poems, all of these things. Uh, while identifying Jewish suffering with African-American suffering, uh, have that problematic or potentially problematic step of uh, co-opting black subjectivity at the same time. Uh, so again, very, very complicated uh, stuff. So I'd like to explore the potential social impact of the play itself. Um, I myself am fascinated by the issue of distance between the audience and the realities of black lives depicted in media because it's something that comes up again and again, even today when the prospect of a white Jewish cast performing all of the black characters in a play would be a distinct impossibility. I'm reminded of the controversy around the movie Green Book and its depiction of the pianist Don Shirley and his driver, which was described by Wesley Morris in the New York Times as being, quote, a racial reconciliation fantasy. And as we well know, in spite of this, it received arguably the highest honor in American cinema, an Oscar for Best Picture. I'm also reminded of a Netflix series that is as close a parallel as we could possibly ask for to the play Mississippi, the 2019 limited series, When They See Us, which was a dramatic depiction of the Central Park Five case co-written and directed by Ava DuVernay. Even here, there are issues of distance. The critic Matt Goldberg wrote that even after watching a documentary featuring interviews with the actual defendants of the case, quote, it doesn't come close to what DuVernay does in the series with this cast and her craftsmanship. How effective do you think this play or 
other similar Yiddish cultural artifacts were at apprising their audience of the realities of Black life in the United States? Hmm. Well, you know, something that Anthony, you had said when we spoke um, about this evening was you asked me, I think, did Leib Malach um, actually get to the South? Um, and then um, it made me insert that comment by the printmaker, Harry Sternberg, that I quoted, saying that they, they just felt so much for the Black people in the South, even though they were always in New York City. Um, I think they're, um, uh, I, I don't think it would cut it now in this day and age. Um, but at the time, um, they, they let their emotions and their imagination travel, do the traveling and, and um, try to transcend the, you know, um, or make up for the loss or the lack of immediacy um, that they had with their subject matter. And I think it was well-intentioned and sometimes it works really well. And I think I, I would say that this worked very well um, in its in its day, um, but I think we've grown much more sophisticated. There is kind of an element of proto consciousness raising. Um, you know, there's there's they're trying to sort of illustrate all these things as an, an almost educational um, fashion, and that the audience, in a sense, gets a, gets an idea. Of, of what is at stake for, for black people in the United States concerning uh, systemic racism. Eli, you look like you were about to jump in here. Thinking about, I was recently, I read, it was recently read the first page of Mississippi. Uh, and in the first page, they're all on the train and they're going uh, through like sort of the, getting little snippets of their biographies. Yes. And one of them says, I fought in Nicaragua. Yes. And then I came back to Alabama and this is my situation. I'm, I'm trying to find work and hop in a freight train uh, and then I, the doom will come to the play. And it just, I think, demonstrates this very short Nicaragua reference um, that uh, there was a, an emphasis on seeing all uh, economic, social, racial struggles as part of a broader system mm -hmm. of class oppression. So not elevating the, the African-American subject um, as an essentialized figure, but showing how in the American context, it was the black man that suffered the misery of every working class in every national or ethnic group. And I think that that argument uh, to Eastern European Jews who may feel as if the walls are, are slowly closing in on them, a, a great sense of empowerment. Uh, I think in terms of what you're saying about consciousness raising, they're looking at African-American culture uh, and these particular African-American subjects uh, as a way to strengthen their own participation in an internationalist uh, community. Um, and that makes the play distinct in the middle of the 1930s from a lot of the earlier discourse about African-Americans, uh, which borrowed more heavily from uh, Western European models um, and, and sort of took for granted the Europeanness uh, of the Jews. In this play, I think um, it's emphasizing uh, the internationalist uh, nature of, of the Jewish community in Poland at this time as a way of resisting uh, the rise of fascism um, mm -hmm. in, in Germany and soon, you know, in, yeah. in Poland as well. I'm reminded tangentially of um, some criticisms that were leveled to some people in, in the Bernie Sanders campaign um, that his analysis was a class analysis and that that was problematic for people who needed actually a racial ana analysis out of their potential candidate. And I, that was summarily addressed, but I feel like that um, orientation uh, initially with a class analysis has precedence, you know, and, and that maybe um, this play to, to a certain degree is, is an artifact uh, of that. 
Yes, yes, I think you're right. I mean, I think it, it addresses it very explicitly. Um, one, um, uh, one character says, this is not about race, this is about class. And, and another one says, no, this is about the color of our skin. Um, so they have that debate in the play. Right, it's a debate that many people are still having today. Right, sure. um, so the aftermaths for the defendants of the Scottboro Boys trials were various. There was retrial, imprisonment, prison escape, and re-imprisonment, eventual parole, death, suicide, and posthumous pardons. Of the women who accused them of rape, one would later recant and the other one never did. I'm curious, in your opinion, how much of themselves might the Scottsboro Boys have seen in the play Mississippi? Hmm. When you say how much would they have seen, what do you what do you mean? If they had had the chance to see the play, would they would have would they have recognized themselves? Would they have recognized their struggles? Would they have recognized you know their reality as um, you know black men in the teeth of the American justice system? So hard. It's um, I I can only speculate. Um, of course. But, um, I think they 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 would recognize themselves a little bit, um, and. Um, I, I think they would be um, um, th there. One of them is made into a kind of um, uh, a, of a, a heroic voice of the of the of the play, and and it's when he decides that really um, redemption for them lies in their embrace of of communism and the working class and and um, and seeing their brotherhood with all these people who want to help them. Um, but but then there are other um, I mean, I would they see themselves in the, the play that it's such a good question, Anthony. Um, I mean, I think it's all in the little details. Like Eli says, the first act is a very long act and they're trying to um, Leib Malach is really trying to round out the characters one at a time. Um, certainly you have the age groups represented. He, he took the number of the boys from nine to seven. It was a little bit, uh, I guess, more manageable. And, um, you know, one of the boys accused was 12 years old when he was accused. Um, and he, they, they kept that and he's, he's, he's treated as the very young, fragile boy that he, he, he was, you know, very, um, he's uh, sick for most of the first act, um, probably um, 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 dehydrated, um, needing water, um, but not able to get off the freight train. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's, there, there's so many characters that they don't get um, real dimension the way um, um, that we would see in some place with a smaller number of people. Um, but uh, I, I, I think they would, you know, it's, it, it does remind me a little bit of Langston Hughes's portrayals of them um, in his, in Scottsboro Limited. Um, it's, I guess it's a yes or no. I'm on the fence about it. Hmm. No, yeah, oh, please go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think definitely that Langston Hughes' own work uh, informs this play or at least uh, the Harlem Renaissance uh, informs this play, um, simply because we know that uh, the Yiddish avant-garde was reading Harlem Renaissance poetry uh, and writing about it, um, as well as prose uh, and, other, um, and other forms, visual art as well. If, would they recognize themselves? I certainly, I don't think on a uh, detail-oriented factual basis, um, but if any of those um, uh, of the Scottsboro boys themselves came to adopt a materialist conception of history, I think that they would find themselves uh, in that play. Uh, again, the perennial debate about um, whether uh, African-American oppression is a question primarily of class or of uh, race conflict uh, is an open question. And so I think that question would have to be refracted back on to uh, questions towards the Scottsboro boys about this play. Um, yeah. 
Of course, Mississippi wasn't the only visitation of this particular miscarriage of American justice. As we've mentioned before, we have Langston Hughes and County Cullen responding directly to the Scottsboro Boys trial in their work. We have permutations of the case bubbling up in Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird and Richard Wright's Native Son. Theatrically, we have a modified version of the events that led to the trial in Jean Paul Sartre's play, The Respectful Prostitute. And we even have another theatrical treatment of the trial itself as a musical in 2010 by Kander and Ebb, the duo who gave us the musical Chicago, which of course was also about another sensational American trial. In 2019 in Weimar, Germany, I personally witnessed the revival of Henrik Kohn's 1924 Yiddish opera, Basheva, under the auspices of the Yiddish Summer Weimar Organization and Joshua Horowitz of Retsky Pass. Kohn, of course, wrote the now lost music for the original production of Mississippi. Yeah. What do you think the difficulties would be in remounting Mississippi? And does it have a potential afterlife beyond the page? Right. I mean, that's a, um, a question a lot of people have been asking me recently, and um, I'm grappling with as I translate it. And there's just there are a lot of issues. And I think I'll just raise two problems. One, um, um, and I'll, I'll raise two problems with a performance of the original in the original Yiddish. So um, not to say that, you know, obviously it also could be translated into English, but I, I was just thinking maybe like what would happen if, if we performed it in the original Yiddish. Um, and one problem has a solution, one doesn't have such a ready solution. I think it's championing of communist ideas is a problem um, in this day and age. And I think it's, it's in the way it does it in the play, I think it's dated. Um, that's my perspective. Um, but I think the um, I think the the problem of um, black characters, um, the black characters, they would need to be played by African Americans, and I think that's not necessarily a problem, given the fact that most um, most actors acting on the Yiddish stage need to learn their lines, um, are, are not Yiddish speaker, speakers and need to learn their lines. So um, I think the solution is to have African-Americans play the black characters on the stage. And I think that's there's how an, I imagine it. There's an amazing young black actor in the recent production of Waiting for Godot in Yiddish. So mm -hmm. the possi okay. and possibility is always there. Um, Eli, what do you think? What really, would be the possibilities? I really, I really liked uh, what you mentioned to me previously was uh, staging this play, uh, but making the play about about staging this play. Yeah. So you have uh, a cast uh, being assembled to stage this play, and at the same time, a surrounding cast mediating the staging for the audience hmm. uh, with in that sense doing something like that is about confronting the politics of remembering this past yeah uh, and and trying to determine the usability of this past um and so a play about that and not necessarily about the scottsboro boys in mississippi but about how we remember the jewish engagement with this play um is is intriguing to me for sure um yes and i think that's what most people would be most interested in in this in this play yeah i, I think that like the use of the n-word very complicated uh yeah. question again it necessitates african-american actors um or at least supervision of supervision <laughs> but even the supervision uh that the African-American supervision of the play being staged being the broader play would be also, I think, a fascinating angle. Um, it's hard, you know, it's a hard question. I don't have a coherent answer. So I have one last question. Mm -hmm. What value is there for us in revisiting these depictions of Black life in Yiddish culture? Like, is there a value in us revisiting these, these very particular um, and very specific depictions of Black life in, in Yiddish literature and art? I mean, uh, yeah, Elisa, if you want to start, or I can Well, start. what I would say um, is that um, 
art is, um, when the art is good, it's rewarding and valuable on that level. Um, so in terms of its social value, um, a play returns the curious audience to the facts of the case and spurs a kind of um, a renewed historical reckoning with the facts. Um, and sometimes this really changes history in a sense that it changes the historical narrative. Um, sometimes it, it, um, it deepens our engagement with history. Um, in this case, for instance, when I was researching the Scottsboro Boys, um, I became aware of the more conventional historical narrative of the Scottsboro Fair, which was had a kind of victorious um, um, dimension to it because the boys were not lynched. Well, Scottsboro didn't end well. It was, you know, most of the men, as you said, Anthony, um, spent many, many years in prison and, um, and one died behind bars. It was, it was very tragic. And it was, um, it wasn't a story of the United States system of checks and balances um, writing itself. Um, and, um, and it was in fact, the communists who really saved the lives of the boys. Um, and, um, and it was feeding this, this global propaganda machine in favor of this very just cause of the boys. It's very complicated. I feel like it has many dimensions to it. And each time I thought I understood it, um, it, it kind of deepened for me, um, this, this much larger picture. Um, um, because by that point, in, by the 1930s, um, the Soviet Union was perpetrating its own atrocities, um, like um, including the Ukrainian famine. So I, I think that um, for me, um, it was, it was re rewarding to, um, to uh, engage in this history and to understand it better. And I think um, when, with these depictions, we're pushed to do that. Um, and so, so for, for me, that's, the, where, that's where the value is. Yeah, I think, um, I guess I'll add to that in the sense of speaking to the more, the broader visual resources that I brought before. Uh, you know, it really, again, is a question of how you use this information and, and under what brackets or under what auspices you're talking about, uh, for example, the Yiddish adaptation of Uncle Tom's Cabin. For me personally, looking at these materials uh, that depict African Americans or American racism in Yiddish, they suggest certain things that rub against uh, accepted knowledge. Like, for example, that the Jewish immigrant was a kind of clean slate when they came to America and through encounter and through a struggle with American culture somehow came to understand uh, race uh, and their place in America's racial hierarchy. These materials, including Mississippi being a, being a Polish Jewish production, really globalize Jewish engagements with questions of race and take America as a, a very significant, but by no means a universal context for these uh, questions. You can also use materials about race uh, to talk about the very uh, robust and popular question of whether Jews are quote, white. Uh, all of these materials can inform us as we make those kinds of determinations in our own lives and in our own teaching and scholarship, uh, these materials are really ripe for interpretation towards that question. Uh, and I think also, um, I think we can see how uh, through some of these materials that I showed uh, that Jews uh, used African-American culture and African-American images to internationalize their posture, um, to transcend the lives that they were living in uh, and the conflicts and the violence that they suffered. And the question of whether that's distinctly Jewish uh, is another question. Um, I think overall though, uh, certainly pre-American sources are, 
uh, ripe for, for uh, interpretation and shouldn't be as, as suppressed or ignored as, as they are uh, in contemporary American Jewish debates about how we perform anti-racist uh, activism. Thank you. More than 80 years after the premiere of Mississippi, the reality of judicial miscarriages of justice against Black people in the United States is as much of a pressing issue today as it was when the curtain rose on a play in Warsaw in 1935. All attendees of tonight's program will be receiving an email with information and resources addressing this issue, in addition to links to a recording of tonight's program and more engaging work from our guests. If you have enjoyed tonight's program, please tell your friends and family and visit us at circle.org. My thanks to our guests this evening, Eli Rosenblatt and Elisa Quint, for what has been a fascinating conversation about this most unusual of Yiddish plays. In two weeks time, we will have the second program in this Worker Circle three-part series, In the Midst, entitled Familiarity and Distance, Yosef Kerler's Vinich Volt in Alabama Zain, featuring translators Maya Ivrona and Amelia Glazer, exploring a work by a Soviet Yiddish poet from 1965, written in response to the American Civil Rights Movement. I'll see you there. My name is Anthony Mordechai Russell, and this has been Injustice and in Interpretation, Leib Malach's Mississippi. Good night. <laughs>